All right, everybody, it's time to get to the back end of Chapter 18, going through the specific glands, the specific hormones, and their effects, their triggers, and their regulation. So um, we are, again, going to focus on the key glands, the pituitary gland, which is going to produce nine hormones total. The thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland that we're going to discuss three hormones, two of which we are, yeah, two of which we've already done in the bone chapter. And the adrenal gland, it's four hormone groups. There's actually quite a bit of hormones, um, but again, it's steroid hormones for most of them that are groups, so we're going to discuss them as a grouping rather than a specific definitive hormone. The penal gland is one hormone, the pancreas is two. The interesting thing about the penile and the pancreas is there's no pituitary gland regulation on those, so that they kind of stand out a little uniquely that way. We are going to do the gonads, um, and again, the females produce three hormones, the males produce two, uh, but the effects of the pituitary regulation, it's FSH and LH on both. We are going to hit a few other organ, organs and hormones that are not typically put in the classical um, endocrine system. Uh, but there's really no other place to kind of go over them, so we will hit the few little oddballs here and there. So let's first get our bearings on the pituitary gland. Back in the sphenoid bone, there's the cella tersica, and in that cella tersica, that little area, there is a piece of material that extends down from the brain, from the diencephalon. Uh, some of that material is the neurons from the hypothalamus, so in the diencephalon of the brain, there's some neurons that are in this hypothalamus that have their axons extend and terminate in the posterior pituitary region. So part of the pituitary gland is actually your hypothalamus neurons extending down into this region. The other part is glands. So it's going to have some cells, some cuboidal type cells that reside here in this anterior part, and those cells are going to make hormones, going to make molecules that exit the pituitary area in the venous blood flow and extend down to their target organs where they have effects, okay? There's a little bit of an area in the middle called the pars intermedia, which is going to make a hormone that, functionally speaking, um, doesn't really seem to have a big determining factor in, in the humans, but in the animal world um, might have a bigger role in play, okay? So I don't need you to know all the specifics. Uh, the hypothalamus is a big controller of the nervous system and set points for temperature and hunger and appetite. So it plays a big role in the neuro world, but with the control and regulation of the anterior pituitary, with some of the neurons extending into the posterior pituitary and excreting two hormones that way, the hypothalamus then kind of falls into both organ systems. It's part of the nervous system, and it is going to have a lot of control, regulation, communication, and um, components that play into the endocrine system. The little area that actually connects the brain properly to this little bulge here is known as the infundibulum. So for vocabulary terms, that would be one to know. Um, and then for the posterior pituitary, it's more towards the back part of this area, and then the front part is the anterior pituitary. If you look at the, again, histology, you can see that the posterior lobe has more axons, so it's more kind of... Um, neurological neuron axons, whereas in the anterior pituitary, it's going to have these uh, kind of cuboidal cells arranged in little um, follicles because it's gland, so it's glandular epithelial tissue, and it's going to secrete hormones, and it's surrounded by a lot of blood, and those molecules, instead of just hanging out and doing paracrine, autocrine type control, uh, it's going to jump into the bloodstream and travel long distances. Right? The MSH comes from the intermediate part, which is a little bit of a blend and barrier that you see between the glandular and the neural tissue in the back and the front. Looking at it from a cartoon, again, your um, neurons that originate with their cell bodies in the hypothalamus have their axons pass through the infundibulum towards the back and up here are glandular cells. Now, one of the key things is the way this um, 
blood supply works. So there's an artery that comes in around the infundibulum and it extends up and around into the area of the hypothalamus of the capillary bed. All right, and this capillary bed doesn't quite just exit and become a vein and leave. It actually kind of starts to gather and collect and extend into another robust capillary bed in the anterior pituitary. And the advantage to this portal system is what it's called is that arterial blood that comes in and feeds oxygen to the hypothalamus and picks up any molecules that the hypothalamus secretes is then going to bring those molecules in the blood straight to the anterior pituitary uh, where it can interact and pick up molecules and release molecules before it heads to the rest of the bloodstream proper. And that's important because that way the hypothalamus doesn't actually have to make a lot of controlling hormones that get released to hopefully make it to their target. Uh, the hypothalamus can release uh, a few molecules from this region that is going to enter the bloodstream, going to get to their target and interact with their target cells um, and influence the target cells and their release of the secondary molecules, the next step, the stimulating hormones, the tro tropic hormones, um, before they then exit and head towards their target. The posterior pituitary it has its own artery that comes in, a typical capillary unit around these exons that are terminating, and then its own vein. So in some ways, this blood supply in the posterior is a typical capillary bed that has an artery in and a vein out. But this of the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus has almost like two capillary beds connected to each other before the blood enters the main venous outflow and then gets back towards the jugular vein and the inferior vena cava or superior vena cava, okay? All right. So if you look at the hypothalamus and the control of the anterior pituitary, again, this is kind of a general thing. For all of the hypothalamus hormones that are heading to the anterior pituitary, they're traveling in the bloodstream, but they're traveling straight to their target. Those hypothalamic hormones fall into one of two categories. They can be hormones that are going to cause the anterior pituitary to release more hormone of their um, stimulation, so they are releasing hormones or they can be inhibiting hormones. Some of our hormones in the anterior pituitary only respond to one, so they only have a releasing hormone. Some are going to have both a releasing and an inhibitory hormone. Now, for many of our anterior pituitary hormones, they are just a intermediate step in the process of controlling whatever process we're controlling. So they are going to then head to their target glands or organ, such as the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, or the ovaries or the testes, and stimulate another hormone to be produced in a certain level. And those hormones then can feed back to the anterior pituitary, regulating the stimulating effects of their hormone and feedback to the hypothalamus regulating the releasing hormones or the inhibiting hormone um, levels, all right? And the targets can be a variety of tissues, such as the heart, such as skeletal muscle, the liver, uh, neurons themselves, and so that's kind of how the system works, all right? So for every anterior pituitary hormone, and we're, we're focusing on about six of them, you need to be able to tell me what comes from the hypothalamus, so is it a releasing hormone, an inhibiting hormone, or both, how then that anterior pituitary makes its hormone, so is it a stimulating hormone or does it go by a different name, where is that hormone headed for its target, and then what are the hormones that come out or what are the effects. All right, so let's start with, the, again, this is kind of a different um, picture, but it's the same thing. The hypothalamus might make a releasing hormone or an inhibitory hormone. That releasing or inhibitory hormone for the portal system heads straight to the anterior pituitary, influences the cells there to create a hormone. That hormone can go to an organ or have an effect. Right? If it has a goes to an organ like ACTH, FSH, LH, it will then trigger that gland to make a hormone that has the effect, right? And the feedback is negative feedback because hormone one feeds back to the releasing or inhibiting hormones, hormone two feeds back also to the hormone one as well as to the hypothalamus, okay? 
So utilizing this little cartoon, if we look at the thyroid pathway, from the hypothalamus, the releasing hormone is going to be thyroid releasing hormone, so TRH. So if you put a T here, you're talking about thyroid releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus and it travels to the anterior pituitary. At the anterior pituitary, it's going to force TSH to be released. And TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. And thyroid stimulating hormone leaves the anterior pituitary, heads to the thyroid gland, and is then going to stimulate the thyroid gland to make T3 and T4. Now, T3 and T4, which are lipid-soluble hormones, are going to bind to their binding protein, hitch a ride in the bloodstream, have to separate from their binding protein, head to cells, inside cells, find their receptor, bind to their receptor, and then cause changes to DNA expression, gene expression, protein synthesis, and protein levels. And that's going to change the metabolism, the building and breaking down of molecules within that cell. All right, so there's lots to that pathway. Now, T3 and T4 levels will influence how much TSH is going to be in the system, as well as T3 and T4 levels will influence RH. So if we're not making enough T3 and T4, we expect that TSH levels to be higher than average, and we expect RH, TRH levels to be higher than average. And the reason why is because the body is not making enough thyroid hormones. So the hormones that are a step above and two steps above are going to increase in size and number because we want to make sure that we're trying to push the thyroid gland to make T3 and T4. So there's a sufficient amount of thyroid in the system. On the flip side, if we don't have enough thyroid hormones being made, or if we have too much, we would expect too high of T3 and T4 levels. So we might expect that there is very little TRH and very little TSH being made by the pituitary and the hypothalamus. All right? And so what we find is we might be hyperthyroidism, but we might be hyperthyroidism because in this case, T3 and T4 being overmade in the thyroid gland and that inhibition of T3 and T4 feedbacks to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to suppress TRH and TSH levels. Okay? If you go to the different hormone from the pituitary gland and we look at eventually making what's known as cortisol and our glucocorticoid category of hormones, we start with CRH comes from the hypothalamus, and CRH stands for corticotropic releasing hormone, and corticotropic releasing hormone heads to the anterior lobe of the anterior pituitary and is going to stimulate ACTH levels, and ACTH level is adrenal corticotropic hormone, so it's a hormone that heads to the adrenal gland to stimulate the adrenal gland to take cholesterol and convert it to cortisol. All right, and cortisol is one of our main forms of glucocorticoids that comes from cholesterol. It's a steroid hormone. All right, we could also make hydrocortisol, hydrocortisine, cortisine. You know, there's a few different versions of cortisol, and you can look at some of the different versions by just go looking at creams that have cortisol and cortisine and hydrocortisine and hydrocortisol cream material in them, okay? Same thing. If cortisol levels are really, really, really low, we would expect that the pituitary gland to make more ACTH, stimulating more cortisol to be made at the adrenal gland. But if cortisol is extremely high, we would expect that it would feed back, back to the uh, pituitary gland and suppress the ACTH levels. All right, and the same thing with the CRH. If we see uh, high cortisol levels, we'd expect it to feed back to the hypothalamus and suppress the releasing hormone. Um, and if we see high, low cortisol levels, we might expect more cortisol releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. All right, the cortisol from the hypothalamus from the adrenal gland is made in the adrenal cortex, so that's the outer part of the cortex. It's made in the middle zone. Again, cholesterol is converted through a series of reactions to a group of molecules that are going to be known as glucocorticoids, cortisol being the main one that we want. 
glucocorticoids by their name are going to influence cells, target cells, so muscle, liver, fat cells, um, epithelial cells, connective tissue cells, and they're going to influence their utilization of glucose for energy. Thus, that's why it has the name gluco in it, because it regulates how cells get to use glucose. One of the other big things that glucocorticoids and cortisol in particular does, which is why we find it in creams, anti-itch creams, anti-rash creams, and you hear about people getting steroids injections, is it suppresses the immune system. So it suppresses immune cells from releasing histamine and releasing uh, irritant factors from their vesicles. So it does have an immune suppression effect. So that's part of the reason why, again, people get steroids injections when they have autoimmune issues or if they have a lot of inflammation occurring because we're trying to get the anti-inflammatory effects from the glucocorticoids. Okay, the last a uh, hormone in this pathway is the pathway that's going to give us um, our FSH and LH. So here is a little bit of a unique thing in that we have GN, which stands for gonado, so it's going to the gonads, gonadotropic releasing hormone. All right, and gonadotropic releasing hormone, when it heads to the pituitary, is going to make two hormones get released, FSH, all right, and LH. Now, in females, FSH is going to the ovaries and is going to stimulate estrogen, so estradiol. Um, it's going to stimulate the production of follicles, thus its name. So it's going to make some of your primordial follicles, some of your egg cells and the supporting cells around them to start to develop into a primary follicle. And then through that process, estrogen is going to start to rise and prepare the body for um, eventual ovulation. So it's going to thicken up the uterus. And it's going to help you know, keep secondary sex characteristics going. So the opportunity to get a sperm into the body is increased in likelihood. Right? So it gets its name follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, because of what it does in the female. It makes the ovary develop primordial follicles into primary follicles and helps to produce, again, from those primary follicles, the estrogen levels that rise and prepare the body for um, potential pregnancy and implantation of a fertilized egg. Now, LH is called luteinizing hormone. So in the female, LH travels to the ovaries, and LH is going to stimulate eventually ovulation. So it's going to be the trigger that is going to tell the body to release the, um, the egg when the egg is developed and matured to a point where it could be fertilized. All right. Now, FSH makes estrogen. And we need FSH levels as the primordial follicle numbers convert to some primary follicles. And eventually, one or two of the primary follicles become a secondary follicle. We need FSH to go down. So the system has a way, because gonadotropic releasing hormone stimulates both. So we need a way to turn the FSH levels off, but let LH continue to increase. And that's where inhibin comes into play. So inhibin is going to travel to the anterior pituitary. And as the number and the size of a primary follicle increases, and some of those granulosa cells around it, it's going to help trigger that we try to only produce one egg per cycle by stopping more um, FSH release, which would push more egg cells to become primary and eventually secondary tertiary follicles. Okay. LH is going to then be able to increase higher levels than what we see for FSH, and that's part of that LH surge. Another part of the LH surge is that estrogen in very high levels, instead of doing negative feedback, actually does positive feedback on LH. So that then also helps facilitate an LH surge at ovulation. The last thing that LH is going to do is the cells that are left when an egg is released. So the egg is one cell, but there are other supporting cells. Those supporting cells under that high LH level are going to convert into what becomes a corpus luteum, CL. And the corpus luteum is going to start to make the hormone progesterone. And progesterone is going to then 
maintain what the estrogens have built up in the uterus. So they are going to maintain the uterine lining. So if the egg that has just been released gets fertilized and implants, it will be able to sustain that pr process of implantation and sticking in mom's uterus and not be sloughed off and lost. Okay, so sometimes in early pregnancy, you'll hear about women have to have progesterone injections or progesterone suppositories because they need help maintaining their uterus and the implanted young um, embryo that's still pretty much in the four, six, eight, nine week uh, point of development. So they'll have to get progesterone shots. Now, on the male side, the FSH and LH stay the same. They're still only gonadotropic releasing hormone. Now, FSH is going to, like in the female, make a gonad produce occur. So it's going to go to the testes and produce the, um, in the testes, it's going to produce sperm cells to develop. And in order to, again, try to keep sperm cell numbers at a relatively normal rate, so it's not too rich in sperm, not too high, inhibin is produced by the uh, nurse cells to help make sure that we have a decent sperm count, but we don't overproduce and overdo our sperm count. And inhibin does that. It inhibits FSH. LH here in the male actually goes to a cell known as a interstitial or Leydig cell. And the interstitial Leydig cell under the influence of LH is going to convert some cholesterol into testosterone, releasing that testosterone so it can, again, secondary sex characteristics as well as facilitate some of the sperm development occurring in the other parts of the testes. Okay. Uh, so, basically, in males, you have inhibin and testosterone. In females, you have inhibin, estrogen, and progesterone. Okay? Now, the other two, because um, now we've gone through four out of six anterior pituitary hormones, the other two are prolactin and growth hormone. Now, prolactin is going to have both an inhibitory and a releasing hormone produced by the hypothalamus. And under normal circumstances, 99% of us, 99% of our lifetime want prolactin to always be inhibited. So we want the releasing factor to be inhibited and we want the inhibitory factor to be the released molecule from the hypothalamus. And in releasing that inhibitory factor, we don't make prolactin. We don't then have it travel to the breast tissue, stimulate breast milk development. Okay? So, guys, this is important that you always have that inhibitory factor. So how do we get this whole, whole thing to switch? Well, it happens with high levels of estrogen and high levels of progesterone, so pregnancy. And pregnancy will then start to um, stop the inhibitory factor and allow the releasing factor to be produced. And that's how pregnancy leads to the development of breast tissue that is then capable of producing milk, OK? And that's why some men who overproduce or overmake testosterone, which can be converted to estrogen, and then very quickly start to have breast development, um, and then can have um, milk development, because again, maybe abusing their steroids inappropriately leads to that process. And they could start to lactate, OK? But they shouldn't. All right, again, growth hormone, to differentiate growth hormones releasing factor from gonadotropic releasing factor, there's no N in the name. So G little n is gonadotropic, GH dash RH is growth hormone releasing factor. All right, growth hormone inhibiting factor, growth hormone releasing factor are going to oscillate. They are going to, there's a little bit of circadian rhythm going on here, and there's some other hormones feedbacking in addition to growth hormone. But basically, you're going to see oscillations of growth hormone. And that means that inhibin or growth hormone inhibiting factor and growth hormone releasing factor are going to be oscillating as well to make growth hormone from the pituitary gland kind of at certain times of the day, maybe be a little higher in um, release versus later or at night. Um, and then growth hormone goes to a lot of tissues. And like testosterone, it has a, an ability to increase protein synthesis, which allows cells to grow because they're making more proteins burning more energy, um, and producing more molecules, all right? One of the targets is the liver, and in the liver, growth hormone can cause the release of what's known as somatomedins, which are growth factors that can influence other cells, as well as feedback to the hypothalamus for the inhibin, uh, inhibiting factor and the releasing factor. 
So the takeaway, yes, you need to know all of the releasing hormones. Yes, you need to know all six of our um, anterior pituitary hormones. You need to know for the six hormones coming from the pituitary gland, what is their specific target, and then you need to know if their target produces a follow-on gland, okay? And you need to know the gist of what the effects of those follow-on glands are going to, the hormones from those glands are going to do, okay? So this is going to be another cartoon from your book to get you comfortable with how the hypothalamus releases or inhibits molecules in the anterior pituitary leading to the six hormones that come out of the anterior pituitary. And then those six hormones are traveling to their targets. And in their targets, they can influence, again, additional hormones to be released. And those hormones have effects. We skip over a little bit the effects of the um, intermediate area of the uh, anterior pituitary, but it does produce a hormone known as MSH, melanin-stimulating hormone. And melanin-stimulating hormone will travel to the melanocytes in your um, dermis of your skin and could potentially stimulate them to produce more melanin. So in people with pituitary hormones, uh, tumors that are overproducing um, all of the hormones from the pituitary gland, so they're overproducing MSH, we might find that they look more tan because so their melanocytes are producing just without sunlight forcing them to more melanin, so the skin takes on more of a tannish or a darker hue, or they might start to have more spotty as, spottiness and make more um, kind of like uh, dark spots on their, on their skin. Okay, functional significance, not exactly sure in adults, um, so we, that's part of the reason why we usually ignore it. In the posterior pituitary, again, the posterior pituitary, there are cells that live in the hypothalamus that extend and terminate in the posterior pituitary, and they make two key hormones. Uh, Antidiuretic hormone, it's known as ADH. We talked about this being about one of those nine to eight amino acid long um, peptides. It travels to the kidneys, and in the kidneys, it influences the water retention. So you want to have ADH to help us retain water. If you block ADH of stimulation from the hypothalamus, you are going to start to lose water. And one of the key things that can block ADH is alcohol. So this is part of the reason why when people start drinking a lot, they have to go to the bathroom a lot. And then after a night of drinking, with all the ADH being suppressed and not released, they get dehydrated and they have a hangover of a headache the next day. Oxytocin, we know, is going to make smooth muscles contract. And so in the reproduction side, oxytocin is what helps trigger um, the uterus to contract, to push a baby out in the birthing process. It helps contract the smooth muscle around the ducts in the mammillary glands. So milk is forced and pushed out of the, um, mammal, uh, the breast tissue. Um, and we know from animals and dogs that oxytocin is part of that love hormone. It's part of making a connection when you stare into your baby's eyes or your puppy's eyes that you make a loving connection to them. So again, some of that love stuff comes back to oxytocin. Okay. For, again, the posterior pituitary, it does have some, again, nervous system specific tissue. It's called the neurohypophoesis because it's neurons. Um, the neurons originate in areas of the hypothalamus and they produce two hormones that head to the kidneys or the reproductive glands. In the kidneys, 4-ADH retains water. Oxytocin in the reproductive glands is going to cause smooth muscle contraction. So it's going to assist with pushing some of the uh, material in the male ducts uh, out, so helping the sperm get the right material, acid-base material in the ejaculate. And in females, it helps push babies out in the birthing process or milk out in the breast. All right, so let's go into the thyroid gland. So. The hypothalamus makes TRH. TRH travels to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary makes TSH. TSH is known as a tropic hormone. It stimulates the thyroid gland to grow as well as produce thyroid hormones. So if you overproduce TSH, you would have a goiter. You would have an enlarged, very big thyroid gland. And you might, if those cells are not acting appropriate, make very little TSH. So 
that are they make very little T3 and T4. And so the TSH levels are high because it's trying to get the thyroid gland to make T3 and T4, and it's not doing it, but it is growing. It is responding to the tropic or the growth effect that TSH has. So the two big effects of TSH, TSH is, one, it can make the thyroid gland grow and keep it to a certain size. Right? And it influences the thyroid gland to make more and release more T3 and T4, which are your thyroid hormones. T3 and T4 stand for thyridine and thyroxine, and they have three iodines attached to it for T3 and four iodines attached to it for T4. And this is one of the reasons why for our salt in our diets, we ionize our salts to be able to make sure that iodine is presented to our human body in a sufficient amount so our then thyroid gland can make thyroid hormones. Okay? Now, if we look at these cells, it's a gland, it's epithelial. So there's cuboidal cells arranged in these um, kind of circular little uh, follicles, and there is going to be a separation in that little follicle where material separates from the blood supply. Okay? Again, thy thyroxine, T4, thyridine is T3. For making thyroxine and thyridine, again, TRH comes to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland releases TSH. TSH travels to the thyroid gland. One of the things that TSH is going to do is it's going to make the body pull more iodine from the capillaries into the cuboidal cell that is part of the thyroid gland. And then with more iodine into the cell cytoplasm, we can take the amino acid tyrosine, all right, and we can take the ring that is part of tyrosine and attach iodines to it, all right? Now, in order to do this, we actually put it in that little center follicle area, because we kind of have to do this outside of the cell, and we have to do this away from the blood supply. So that follicle and that center kind of ducting area is very important because it allows us to take the benzene ring from tyrosine, take thyroglobulin, take iodine, and put them all together so we create two benzene rings connected with three iodines on it or four iodines on it. And then we re-intake that finished product so we can then make T3 or T4, and we release it into the blood supply. Right? So when TSH is getting us more iodine into the system, we can make more T3 and T4 and release more T3 and T4 into the blood supply. Now, because these are very lipid-soluble molecules, they will not want to be free-floating in the blood. So if you ever look at your blood um, printout from a blood test, you'll see that the, the free T3 or free T4 levels are super, super low. All right? And the reason why is because most of the, the hormone has to be bound to a different binding protein, such as thyroid binding um, globulin protein, transferritin, or albumin. And those proteins then help this molecule stay suspended in the blood, in the water-rich environment, that is blood, uh, until they can separate and then go and have effects on the protein or the, the molecules and the protein synthesis of their target cells. Okay. So again, we take tyrosine and we take off, for one of them, we take off all of this excess stuff, all right, and we take that benzene OH ring and we connect it to another tyrosine, all right? And so by having all of these carbons, the six here, the six here, and the three here, it becomes a very anti-water molecule, and it actually wants to be in a fat environment. So that's part of the reason why we have to bind it to binding proteins, all right? Now, ultimately, we want T3. So T3 is eventually what we really, really, really want to make. But it's easier to make T4 and add the two iodines and eventually take off one of those iodines from um, the active form, which is thyridine. Right, triodothyroline, right? Um, so you'll find that most of what is actually free is the T3. Most of what is bound is T4, all right? And T4, when it unbinds, also needs to convert to T3 to be an active form of the hormone, okay? 
So what do T3 and T4, specifically T3, do when it goes into cells, binds to its receptor, and then causes changes in cell uh, protein levels, cell metabolism, building and breaking down? It's typically going to, again, help the cells get triggered to grow because they're going to make more proteins, make more molecules. It's going to help the cells burn more energy because they're making more proteins. That might be important in the um, processes of breaking down fats and glucose. It's going to help, again, with that increase break down and build up, need to get the body moving more oxygen to those cells, more amino acids to those cells. So whole body metabolism, whole body building, breakdown, whole body need for fuel, whole body need for making proteins, whole body need for having energy available and oxygen available is going to increase. And that's part of the reason why someone who's hyperthyroidism tends to be very skinny, tends to have a lot of energy, tends to be very hot and not tolerate heat because they already have a lot of high metabolic activity going on, a lot of protein baking, a lot of breaking down of fuel, and a lot of ATP being expended. On the flip side, low thyroid levels tend to mean that the cells are not growing, they're not burning energy, they're not making a lot of proteins, and so that person tends to be overweight, maybe even obese, tends to be with uh, lack of energy being consumed and making ATP and expending ATP. They might not do well in cold temperatures because they don't have a good ability to ramp up their ATP breaking down. Okay. Um, for more specifics of what else happens in the thyroid gland. All right, so remember that the thyroid gland is going to make T3, T4, but it has these other cells in between the follicles that are known as C cells, and they are going to also be known as parafollicular cells, so around the follicles. They are going to make the hormone calcitonin, and review from the bone is that calcitonin regulates the calcium levels in your plasma and in your body, all right? And calcitonin tries to inhibit osteoclasts, so calcium stays in the bone. Therefore, I don't get calcium put into the, to the blood supply, all right? And it stimulates calcium to get excreted by the kidneys. And so what it helps me do is when I have really high concentrations of calcium in my blood, in my blood plasma, I don't um, release more calcium into it. I don't retain calcium in the kidneys, and it can maybe even help put calcium into our bones, building our bones um, into more matrix, so therefore blood calcium levels should come down, okay? The parathyroid gland is usually discussed with the thyroid gland. On the posterior side, there's these little four bulges that are technically different epithelial cells, different epithelial little glandular sites that are not going to make calcitonin or T3, T4, but are going to make a parathyroid hormone, right? It comes from these parathyroid cells known as chief cells. They respond to low concentrations of blood calcium and are going to stimulate the bone to put more calcium. They are going to stimulate the gut to retain more calcium from food we take in, and they're going to get the kidneys to do a better job of retaining calcium so it does, isn't lost in the urine. And so with all of those effects, it's trying to raise low blood calcium levels back towards a normal amount, all right? And we went through these two, again, that they work in opposition. PTH tries to raise the blood calcium. Calcitonin tries to decrease the blood calcium. One of the things that happens with people with thyroid issues is they eventually maybe have to have their thyroid gland removed. When they have their thyroid gland removed, they take exogenous or they take a drug for T3 and T4 levels. But what they don't usually take is any PTH or calcitonin. So their blood calcium regulation might get screwed up as a secondary effect of problems with their thyroid levels and their thyroid gland being removed because it's very hard to separate out the parathyroid gland. So in summary, you should be able to talk me through now the hypothalamus is making TRH. TRH goes to the pituitary gland and makes TSH. TSH, which is one of our glycoproteins, travels in the bloodstream, hits its G protein receptor in the thyroid gland to uptake more iodine. So that's one effect. The other effect is to make more tyrosine converted with the help of the binding protein in the follicle into T3, T4, and more T3, T4 produced is then going to mean more T4 and T3 in the bloodstream. More T3, T4 in the bloodstream, again, means the 
three levels go up, plus the bound levels might um, need to go up as well, the number of binding proteins. And more T3, T4 means more cells able to burn fuel, making more ATP, more ATP expended, more energy expended, as well as more cells grow because they make more proteins. They use more gene ex to uh, make proteins, so whole cell metabolism, building and breaking down activities are increasing in number and amount. Next one is the adrenal gland. So again, our adrenal gland, we have the hypothalamus, the main, one of the main pathways for one of the main groups is, is going to release CRH. CRH, cortical releasing hormone, travels to the pituitary gland and influences ACTH. ACTH is going to travel to the adrenal cortex. So the adrenal gland has two parts. The outer one third is known as the cortex, all right? That is a very fat rich environment. It's divided into three zones. And a lot of cholesterol here is going to then be converted to one of three groups of steroid protein, uh, steroid hormones. The inside is called the medulla. And the medulla is kind of unique in that it's tied to the sympathetic output from the um, autonomic nervous system. And it's going to take the tyrosine amino acids and convert it to dopamine and then convert it to epinephrine and then some of it into norepinephrine, and then most of it, 80%, is into epinephrine. And epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, is going to extend the autonomic nervous system fight or flight response beyond a few seconds. So this is what, beyond the first few seconds of getting scared or being chased by the bear, you can run away from the bear or climb the tree away from the bear for that two-minute to hour point later. Okay? Now, for the adrenal cortex, again, I said it's a fat-rich area. So here's the capsule. So this is a dense, irregular connective tissue. The first fat-rich area is known as the zona glomerulosa. The second area is the zona fasciculata. And the third is the zona reticularis. Then you transition into this neuro-like tissue that's going to make your norepinephrine and epinephrine. Now, ACTH wants to come to the zona fasciculata, and it wants in the zona fasciculata all of these cells to take cholesterol and make more cortisol, okay? So that's the pathway from the hypothalamus. We make TRH, TRH, or CRH, CRH from the pituitary gland influences ACTH. ACTH travels to the adrenal cortex, specifically the zona fasciculata, and triggers um, cortisol release, glucocorticoids, okay? Glucocorticoids to include cortisol, hydrocortisine, hydrocortisol, cortis cortisine, cortisol, whatever, all of them, is going to travel to many, many, many different cells such as liver, skeletal muscle, fat, and it's going to trigger in those cells to glucose spare for energy consumption, so burn fat, burn protein to make your ATP and not burn your glucose. The other effect is it's going to suppress immune cells, so it has an anti-inflammatory response. It prevents inflammation. It prevents immune cells to be as robust and function as efficiently, okay? Now, the zona glomerulosa all right, is another area that's going to take your cholesterol and through a series of reactions going to convert it to a category of hormone known as the mineral corticoids. Now, the main mineral corticoid that we are of interest for hormones is going to be aldosterone. Now, aldosterone heads to the kidneys. And in the kidneys, in the nephron, it is going to work on the post here, uh, the distal convoluted tubule, so the DCT, the distal convoluted tubule, the nephron, and a little bit of the collect collecting duct, and it's going to make that area of the nephron keep sodium and dump potassium. And by keeping sodium, water is going to remain with it, and we're going to see that more sodium, more water, we increase blood volume because we have more water retained, which means we increase the fluid in our tubes, and more fluid pushing on tube size is going to increase blood pressure. 
right? Now, one of the main stimuli for the zona glomerulosa is going to be what is your blood calcium levels. And if I have too high of blood, sorry, potassium levels, the K, that is going to be one of the triggers for the cells in the zona glomerulosa to make more aldosterone. And in doing so, aldosterone helps our body get rid of excess potassium, excess K ions. Another stimulus, a second stimulus, is going to be angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is a hormone that comes from a pathway that originates in the kidneys. And angiotensin 2 is going to be trying to increase blood pressure. Right, so it's going to, its main goal is to get more sodium and more water retained, so blood pressure and blood volume increase. All right, so angiotensin II has lots of effects, but one of its effects is to increase aldosterone released from the zona glomerulosa. One of the effects of aldosterone is like other parts of what angiotensin II is, it helps retain water, it helps retain sodium, it helps increase blood pressure. Okay. Now, the zona fasciculata is going to take, again, that ACTH influence that comes into these cells, and it's going to help trigger cholesterol to be made into a lot of different glucocorticoids, the main one being cortisol. Okay? And cortisol then leaves and can head to a variety of tissues and influence their glucose levels and their burning of glucose levels for fuel. The other thing that cortisol does, again, for your um, immune function is to suppress your immune system. So that's part of the reason why people that have an inflamed, painful joint sometimes get a cortisone shot, because it is how we can force the immune system in an inflamed area of the body to dampen or lessen their effects, or dampen and lessen the inflammation effects that they're causing. Okay. All right, so again, this is the big hypothalamus pathway you should be able to talk me through. The hypothalamus makes CRH, CRH goes to the pituitary, makes ACTH, ACTH heads to the adrenal cortex, the zona fasciculata, to make more cholesterol into a few different molecules that are all collectively known as glucocorticoids, the main one being cortisol, which can be converted to cortisone. All right. Now, if for some reason the anterior pituitary, anterior pituitary makes way high amounts of ACTH, so you have a tumor, ACTH will push the adrenal gland to make a huge amount of glucocorticoids, but there is going to be some spillover, and you're actually going to see really, 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 really high ACTH levels are going to make high amounts of glucocorticoids as well as high amounts of aldosterone and high amounts of our third group of um, steroid hormones from the adrenal cortex, from the zona reticulosis, which is your and androgens, right? Uh, on the flip side, again, if you don't make ACTH, you're not going to have sufficient cortisol levels being made. So again, this whole pathway is one of the ways the hypothalamus can respond and control some of our stress responses and our immune responses and our glucose sparing, glucose utilization for energy. So that's why it gets involved there and not everywhere else. All right, the last zone in the cortex is the one that's closest to the um, to the inside medulla region that is going to be where, again, most of our epinephrine and norepinephrine, adrenaline and noradrenaline is made is the zona reticularis. And the zona reticularis can produce a little bit of, of, of androgens under some of the spillover of ACTH, but mostly it makes a little background androgen level. So this is, in females, important because this is your little bit of testosterone you get secreted by your body. And that little bit of testosterone is what drives your sex drive and drives some of your um, testosterone-like effects for protein synthesis. All right. In men, you already are making most of the androgens in your system from your testosterone, from your LH uh, pushing the testes uh, to make your Leydig cells make testosterone. So this is just a little extra above and beyond what's already being produced in the um, testes. All right. And again, uh, testosterone and androtestes 
testosterone can very quickly be converted to estradiol and estrone. So again, if you're overtaking your testosterone um, or steroids uh, in a shot or overproducing testosterone from the testes, this can be one of the ways that excess little testosterone could be converted into estrogens for males and then be some of the reasons why, you know, overproduction here can be starting to feminize males. For the most part, um, the zona reticularis, again, in females, is producing the androgens that give them a little bit of that sex drive, a little bit of some of the hair, some of the, you know, secondary sex characteristics. When women go through menopause and they lose their estrogen being produced by the ovaries, this area still makes some estrogens and testosterone. And so that's part of the reason why old ladies start to get, like, Maybe their Adam's apple maybe develops more protrusely. Maybe they start to have hair on their face, like little mustaches. And it's because the androgens produced here start to push the females with less estrogen being made in the, estro uh, the ovaries into more of a masculine look. Okay? All right. So, again, the adrenal cortex produces glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and your androgens. All right. The adrenal medulla is going to be part of the autonomic nervous system and make more catecholamines. The catecholamines produced here are going to have a prolonging effect. So they are going to take what the nervous system tried to initiate and got started for two, three, five seconds, and they are going to prolong that effect because they are hormones, and they are going to mostly make the adrenaline epinephrine instead of from the nervous system, the norepinephrine. They are going to continue the fight or flight response. So they are going to continue to push skeletal muscles to be able to work at a high intensity output because they're utilizing glucose to make ATP. They are going to continue to push fats to burn energy um, and other processes that help us run away or fight and stay alert and blood supply and blood pressure flowing to the skeletal muscles out of the heart and deliver oxygen. So lots of effects for the catecholamines, prolonging the neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, autonomic fight or flight response. They use the same receptors, the adrenal uh, adrenergic receptors, so the alpha and the beta receptors. So in summary, your adrenal gland could be called the suprarenal gland. The adrenal cortex makes steroid hormones, it has three zones. Zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticulosa. ACTH comes to mainly the zona fasciculata to push the glucocorticoid release, the stress hormones to be released to manipulate glucose handling in cells and to have an anti-inflammatory effect. Your zona glomerulosa which is the outermost, is going to influence sodium retention with aldosterone and potassium excretion. So it has an ability to help us raise blood pressure by retaining sodium and retaining water and lower blood potassium levels. Two ways to get it made with high potassium levels in the body, which we don't want, are angiotensin II release, which again comes back from the kidneys signaling that we have low blood pressure, low blood volume. Uh, the androgens can have, again, in females, the little bit of testosterone made from our system. In males, it's just extra testosterone that can be converted to estrogen to have some of the estrogen effects. Uh, for the most part, the androgens will respond a little bit to excess ACTH levels, but they're kind of a background amount outside of normal healthy testes and ovary production of the gonad of the steroid hormones. Okay. In the center, the cells in the medulla are tied. They are considered the postsynaptic cells of the autonomic nervous system, and they produce more catecholamines in addition to what is released from the sympathetic nervous system's norepinephrine output that happens initially in a fight or flight response. More catecholamines circulating in the blood allows the sympathetic fight or flight response to be prolonged beyond a few seconds or a minute, and so we can continue to burn fuel, stay focused, deliver oxygen, have a high blood pressure, have dilated blood vessels in some regions and constricted blood vessels and redistributed blood flow from the gut and the kidneys and the ovaries and non-essential organs 
organs for survival and get that blood to skeletal muscle so we can get out of that situation. Okay? All right, moving on to the penile gland, one of the glands that we don't go into the hypothalamus control. The penile gland is going to be very close to the uh, optic chiasm and the optic tracts that are carrying light energy towards the occipital lobe of your brain so that you're converting it into visual cues and making a perception of reality by that energy hitting your uh, photoreceptors. So part of what that photoreceptor triggering and then carrying information to the occipital lobe is going to do is it's going to also carry information to the penile gland that we have light hitting our eyes, we are in high light conditions, so suppress melanin, or we're in low light conditions, so produce melanin. And in humans, melanin, melatonin is going to um, melatonin, not melanin, melatonin, 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 is going to tell us what it's day and night. So it helps us with day-night cycles. And then as days have 12 or more hours of light, that helps us know when we're in spring and summer versus when the days start to have 12 hours or less light, we know we're in fall and winter. In animals, that is huge, that they know what season they're in with the daylight being less than 12 or greater than 12 hours because that influences their breeding behaviors. For us, we overrule a lot of this. You do hear about people taking melatonin to help them sleep, um, and again, because melatonin typically is high in humans when there's more darkness, and darkness means we should be sleeping, okay, for our circadian rhythm. The other big gland that is not influenced by the hypothalamus is the pancreas. The pancreas is going to be a big player in making digestive enzymes that break down carbohydrates, that break down um, your fats into smaller molecules so they can be uptaken into the body. They help break down nucleic acids. They may help break down uh, proteins into amino acids. And then that way what you take into the gut is the smallest building blocks that your then cells can rebuild into new nucleic acid DNA RNA molecules, new um, proteins new stored carbohydrates or new stored fats or used fats for energy. But another part of the pancreas is there are these cells that make hormones. And these cells are going to make hormones based upon blood glucose levels. So the exocrine part is all the enzymes that get shot into the small intestines. The endocrine part is going to be the alpha and beta cells that make two key hormones. Insulin, when glucose levels are high in our blood. Glucagon, when insulin levels are low in our blood, right? Insulin is a peptide hormone. Its main effect is to help get glucose into cells, okay? So when insulin makes glucose go into cells, it then also, within a variety of cells, influences what the cells use for fuel. Does it get to now use the glucose to make ATP, or does it have to not use glucose and store it, or does it have to use fat, or does it have to use protein? So insulin influences the glucose going into the cells, as well as in those cells, what to do with the glucose. Does it store it? Does it use it for energy? Now, insulin's receptor is one of those unique receptors that is not a G protein, so it doesn't use second messengers like cyclic AMP, and it doesn't use calcium second messengers. And understanding the insulin receptor is, for some researchers, been their life's work. And guess what? We still don't understand it 100% because we don't have a cure for type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Okay? Now, glucagon is a separate protein hormone made by the alpha cells, and it's released when glucose levels of the bloodstream are super low. And the whole goal of glucagon is to spare glucose so it's not uptaken by any other tissue except the nervous system. And so it makes the liver put more glucose into the bloodstream, so as the neurons pull it out to use for energy, because neurons can only use glucose to make their energy, the, what is pulled out is replaced by glucose being made in the liver. So skeletal muscle can't use the glucose in the bloodstream. Fat can't pull the glucose in the bloodstream. Uh, the other thing that glucagon is going to do is tell skeletal muscle and fats to utilize fat and protein for energy consumption. 
Okay, so hypoglycemia, you're going to have high levels of glucose or glucagon. And trying to help you maintain a glucose level in your bloodstream that allows the neurons to function. Hyperglycemia, too much glucose, you're going to see insulin come up. Right? And so again, the goal is to keep glucose anywhere from 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. Too much glucose, insulin comes into play to help us bring it down, push it into cells so it stays at a normal amount in the blood. Too little glucose in the blood, glucagon is going to try to help us prevent glucose from being uptaken by any cell except the neuron and push the liver and some other places to make glucose available. So as the neurons pull glucose out, glucose is coming in from another source. And it's going to make other cells use other fuels so glucose is not the desired fuel by skeletal muscle, fat, and other things. Okay? Other hormones made in other tissues. All right? The intestines makes almost as many hormones as the entire classical endocrine system. We're not going to do it this chapter. You're going to get that in AMP2. The kidneys. So remember we had that angiotensin 2. That is a major hormone pathway that's about regulating blood pressure and water retention. All right, so we need to kind of talk a little bit about that, but we are going to talk heavily about that in AMP2. The heart is going to make some hormones specifically for blood pressure as well as for preventing overstretching of the heart. So it's a little bit of self-preservation because the heart wants a little bit of stretch to get the sarcomeres in the right alignment to increase contractility or force produced by the muscle cells contracting, but it doesn't want to be overstretched because that'll damage it. So some of the heart can produce enzyme or hormones that are going to influence, again, fluid retention, blood pressure levels, blood volume levels to prevent overstretching. The thymus gland, we're not going to talk about it at all because it's in the lymphatic system, so we'll leave that for AMP2. And the gonads, we've already hit on a little bit of FSH and LH being produced under gonadotropic releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, and they're heading to the testes and the ovaries, and we are going to talk about that in this chapter, and we are going to hopefully see it in AMP2 as well, time permitting. Okay, so let's talk about the kidneys. All right, we've already talked about calcitriol. Vitamin D3 heads to the kidneys and is converted to calcitriol, and calcitriol plays a role in calcium handling and calcium storage in the bones. Right Now, another hormone that comes from the kidneys is urethropotent. Urethropotent is going to be an important hormone that tells the blood to make more red blood cells. The kidneys have one vessel that brings blood into it, and it's called the renal artery. So if the kidneys are going to get 300 milliliters of blood a minute, that 300 milliliters of blood has to have enough red blood cells to provide enough oxygen for all of the ATP making aerobic metabolism processes that are running in every cell of the kidney. All right? There is no back door. There's no other vessel that's bringing blood in. So if the renal artery is not bringing in sufficient red blood cell rich blood, urethropotin will be made by the kidneys to try to get the red blood cell count to increase. So that way, if I'm only bringing 3 million red blood cells in, 3 million milliliters or 300 milliliters of blood, and that's not going to work for me for oxygen delivery, the erythropotent is going to make my 300 milliliters of blood maybe have 4 million red blood cells or 5 million red blood cells. And by increasing that number, I'm hopefully now delivering more oxygen to meet the demands of the kidney. All right? The third hormone produced by the kidneys is, is renin with one N. And renin with one N is going to lead to, it's technically an enzyme, it's going to head from the kidneys to the liver, and it's going to initiate a hormone pathway that's known as the RAS pathway, the renin-angiotensin system. Renin is a hormone slash enzyme because, one, it comes from the kidneys when the kidneys see that there's not sufficient amount of blood volume and blood pressure at the nephron level. So I'm not getting enough blood to the kidneys to be adequately then filtered to produce a sufficient amount of um, 
of pressure for the system. All right. So the goal of renin is eventually to raise blood volume and raise blood pressure. So renin is heading to the liver. When it heads to the liver, it's going to help make the liver produce more angiotensinogen and angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensinogen and angiotensin 1 can do things, there can be hormones, but they, what we really need them to do is angiotensin 1 to be converted to angiotensin 2 by an angiotensin converting enzyme. And if you look at angiotensin converting enzyme as an acronym, it's ACE, the ACE enzyme, right? Angiotensin converting enzyme ACE takes angiotensin 1, makes it into angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 can go to the kidneys and have effects that retain more sodium and increase blood volume and increase blood pressure. And if you go back to the zone of glomerulosis in the suprarenal or the adrenal gland, angiotensin 2 is going to release more aldosterone, the mineral corticoid from the zone of glomerulosa, which will then on a separate part of the kidney nephron, retain more sodium, retain more water, dump potassium, but that process helps us increase blood volume, increase blood pressure. Angiotensin II can also go to the hypothalamus and increase ADH release from the posterior pituitary. More ADH, more retaining of fluid in a different part and a different mechanism of the kidney, more fluid retention, more blood pressure. ADH also makes us thirsty, more fluid intake. So through renin, seeing and producing in the kidneys that we have low blood pressure and angiotensin II being made, we get not just one way, but we get three or four different things going on that help us bring more fluid in, keep more fluid from being lost, keep more retention of the fluid in the blood supply, so we raise blood volume, we raise blood pressure. Okay? And so that's kind of what the cartoon is talking you through. For the heart, again, the heart is trying to prevent overstretching. Right? So when angiotensin II and aldosterone and ADH are retaining fluid, retaining blood volume, re making blood pressure high, A and P and from the brain, B and P are trying to prevent too much fluid in the system, which would mean too much fluid for uh, a given heartbeat, so too much stretch on the chambers, which will damage them. So they are made when the heart is trying to prevent too much stretch in the right atria, the right ventricle, the left atria, and the left ventricle, okay? And so AMP and BMP are going to go to the kidneys and try to block angiotensin and block aldosterone and block retention of sodium, block retention of water, and in doing so, help us increase our urine output and lose more sodium and lose more water molecules, thus decrease blood volume, all right? Thymus gland, we'll talk about it next semester. For the most part, it makes hormones that help you produce T cells, T lymphocytes, which are important in your immune cell function. The last thing we got to talk about is the gonads from the pituitary gland. Again, gonadotropic releasing hormone travels to the anterior pituitary. FSH is made in LH. Again, they get their names because of the females. In males, FSH is traveling to the testes. In the testes, they are going to head into the area where the sperm cells are. And in those cells, there are this population of nurse cells, also called Sertoli cells. They help the sperm-producing cells propagate and go through mitosis and mature into sperm, spermatids. So they are what's helping one cell become four sperm. Right? FSH is going to, with the help of the Sertoli cells, influence more of those stem cells to become four sperm cells, thus making more sperm count happening. Right? Now, to keep FSH from making too many cells become spermatids, four spermatids, and keeping and making our sperm count too high. Sertoli cells are going to make the hormone inhibin, which can travel back to the anterior pituitary and block just the FSH. So that means that FSH levels will not overproduce too many sperm. And so our ejaculate should have anywhere from a low to moderate to a little high sperm count, sufficient, hopefully, to play statistics and, if injected to a female, deliver some sperm to potentially an egg in one of the fallopian tubes, okay? Now, 
the other side of the equation is gonadotropic releasing hormone produces luteinizing hormone, LH. LH travels to a different cell known as the Leydig cells, helps the Leydig cells take cholesterol and convert it to testosterone. Now, testosterone can travel into the bloodstream to have all the secondary sex characteristics. Make your muscle grow. Have lots of protein. Make your... Um, make your brain demasculinized, make your uh, hair on your chest, make your hair on your face, make for too much hair, make the hair disappear on your head. Some of that testosterone will influence in the rest of the testes near those Tertulli cells and those developing sperm metids will help with the development of sperm that are functional and able to be injected and ejaculated into a female. Right? But most of what's going on with LH is testosterone, okay? Now, testosterone is the main androgen in males, and it has a variety of effects. It has effects on skin, on your maintaining your testes and your penis to be a certain size, to maintain muscle mass, so you have large muscles with lots of sarcomeres, lots of myofibrils, strong muscles, to maintain your bone density, so it helps push some calcium to be put into the bones, and to maintain the bone health and growth, to maintain your bone marrow and your brain, your sex drive, your aggression, and some other uh, emotional personality things, right? Now, for the females, the hypothalamus makes gonadotropic releasing hormone. Gonadotropic releasing hormone pushes FSH and LH. FSH travels in the ovaries to the cortex of the ovaries and pushes a egg and the surrounding cells, which are going to be the primordial follicle to develop into a primary follicle. Right? Now, it doesn't push one, it pushes a few primordial follicles to become primary follicles. And as those primary follicles grow and develop, the supporting cells around the egg are going to make estradiol and inhibin. Right? And inhibin is heading back to the anterior pituitary to prevent FSH from continuing to rise so we don't continue to push too many eggs in a given cycle. So this is part of the way that we only produce one viable egg in a monthly female cycle. Right? The estrogen is going to feed back to the hypothalamus, putting more um, gonadotropic releasing hormone and eventually putting more LH to surge, so that way when we know that a primary follicle is converted to a secondary follicle and the secondary follicle is converted into a fully mature tertiary follicle, we know when to ovulate and release that egg. Okay, Estradiol is going to do the secondary sex characteristics and estradiol is going to um, have an effect on the female sex um, system and on the, um, I, I lost my train of thought, on mitochondria and the heart and all kinds of other organs. It's also going to the uterus and it's going to push the uterus to develop and grow. So should an egg get fertilized and make it to the uterus through one of the fallopian tubes from the ovary it came from, it can implant and then continue to be in, with the help of progesterone, carried to full term. Now, LH triggers uh, ovaries to ovulate. The cells from that follicle that are not eggs, because there's only one, the, the follicular cells that stay behind and are going to then, under that LH, convert into a corpus luteum. They are going to now produce not estradiol, but high amounts of progesterone. And progesterone is what's now going to prevent GnRH, LH, and FSH from being produced. So while we are waiting to see if that fertilized egg implants, we don't want to have any more eggs develop. All right? The corpus luteum is a 14-day time window. So it will make progesterone in high amounts for 14 days. The corpus luteum is going to die in 14 days, and the progesterone is going to drop unless the fertilized embryo makes HCG, and HCG from that embryo maintains the corpus luteum, maintains the progesterone. So when you look for a pregnancy test, you're looking to see, does the female have high HCG levels, meaning does it have a fertilized embryo 
trying to maintain a corpus luteum, trying to maintain progesterone levels so the uterus doesn't lose it, doesn't slough it off, doesn't miscarry it. Okay? Now, when we look at the female, again, we look at ovulation as kind of a midpoint. Before ovulation, that is where the follicle is developing. So that is where FSH and LH are stimulating the follicles, then pushing the fo fully matured tertiary follicle to release a fully mature oocyte, right? And we're pushing the uterus to grow, and that's estrogen. So this early before ovulation is FSH, is LH, and estrogen. After ovulation, it's all about progesterone. And so we maintain and thicken up the uterus to hold the hopefully fertilized embryo. We suppress FSH, LH, and gonadotropic releasing hormone. So that way we don't, before we even know for sure, maybe you're carrying a kid, make other follicles develop. Okay? Now, before I close the chapter on the endocrine system, we don't really have another place to talk about it, but Recently, with the Human Genomic Project, we have learned that adipose tissue, fat cells, are actually more active as tissue than just taking in fat and storing it and releasing fat when the body tells it to release fat so it can be used by skeletal muscle and other cell types for energy. Right? Fat tissue communicates to the brain, fat tissue communicates to the digestive tract, to the stomach, to the small and large intestines. So there are a lot of molecules released between the fat cells and the stomach, the fat cells and the brain, the fat cells and other components of knowing how much energy is coming in with food and knowing when to tell our food intake to increase or our food intake to decrease. So when to be hungry or when to be um, full. So when to have appetite stimulated, when to have appetite suppressed. One of the hormones that is well categorized, it's so well categorized we have mouse models made that are leptin knockout mouse, leptin triggered mouse, leptin receptor knockout mouse. So we have done this in mice and rats. We've genetically bred and designed rats and mice that don't make leptin, don't have a leptin receptor, will only make leptin when we trigger it, etc. And so we've learned a lot about how leptin works. Leptin is a molecule that is one of many. So it's not the only one, so this is not a cure for obesity, for overeating. This is one of many, but it has a control in appetite. It also has a control in gonadotropic releasing hormones. So that is part of the reason why if a person is really, really, really obese, they have a hard time getting pregnant because high fat, high leptin output can influence not just your brain's ability to want to be hungry or not, but it can also influence your release of gonadotropic releasing hormone, which then influences FSH, so it can influence a female's egg production or a male's sperm cell production. Okay. Um, for the most part, what we found is if we have uh, leptin production high, you will um, have a... Uh, you'll have, if you do high leptin, you are going to be skinny because you are going to not want to eat. It suppresses your appetite. If you don't make leptin, so if I have a leptin knockout mouse, he will never then get the leptin produced from the fat because I knocked out that gene, and he will eat and 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 get super, super fat because he doesn't have one of his signals for stopping to eat, okay? So that's kind of what we've learned is leptin is one of the controls to try to suppress food intake and help us control body weight. So at this point, we should know most of our glands and hormones from the classical endocrine system, where they're going because of what the hormone is for amino acid or peptide or fat, how it gets there, whether it has to use a binding protein or not, and then once it gets there, what receptor it uses, if it's in the cell or on the membrane, and then how that then receptor triggers second messengers or has effects in the cell that lead to the, the outward changes to the whole body um, that we're looking for with high or low hormone levels. 
Uh, for feedback, it's almost always negative feedback, except in the estrogen LH cycle in the female reproductive tract. And, in, and ne negative feedback, again, allows for our hormone levels to be suppressed as the output is increasing. Okay? So that is endocrine. That is chapter 18. There's a lot to this chapter. And most of test two for bio 207 AMP1 here at Merrimack with Dr. Granier is going to be um, you know, heavy in the hormones and then heavy in the hormones and their effects on skeletal muscle since the chapter is about skeletal muscle. All right, I will see you in class.